Our third and last speaker in this panel today is Fred Smith, uh, who's a colleague and old friend of mine uh, and a, a, a fellow student uh, of the doctoral program in South Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's coming to us uh, from the University of Iowa, where he's a professor in the uh, uh, Asian Language and Literature Department and also in the Religious Studies Department. Um, but he's coming to us via India, where he's been spending the year on his sabbatical leave at present. Uh, Fred has worked in a number of areas uh, of classical Sanskrit, uh, uh, classical Indian religions, uh, beginning with uh, studies of Vedic rituals uh, for his doctoral dissertation. He's one of the major translators of the great Indian epic, Mahabharata. He's working on a, uh, as you may know, it's the largest text in the world, and uh, he's working on a major section of it. Uh, and he's also the author of a of a, of, an, uh, of a noteworthy and well-received book titled The Self-Possessed, which came out from Columbia University Press in 2006, and that just shy of 700 pages is the definitive work on possession rights and uh, possession in uh, Indian tradition. Uh, he's also a co-author of a book with our previous speaker, Dagmar Ryastik, a, uh, an edited volume titled Modern, Modern and Global Ayurveda, Pluralism and Paradigm, and um, Fred also is not just a Sanskritist, uh, someone who works on pre-modern South Asia. He's lived in India for many years. He speaks uh, the local languages. And he does something that we, I think you suggested it could be called ethnoindology, where you look at classical texts and traditions and also see how those classical texts and traditions are lived and practiced today in, in directly relevant ways. Um, which is difficult to do, to master a classical body of literature and also engage fully and, and completely with people who are doing things that may have been talked about in many of these texts. So Fred is here uh, to give us a talk titled Continuities and Disjunctions in the History of Indian Mental Health Care, and we welcome to you to the university. Uh, thank you, John, for your... Um, more than copious introduction, and to the other speakers, John and Dagmar. Um, and they'll be very difficult acts to follow, I assure you. I, I left both of those papers. Um, and I will, as it turned out, there, there's a couple of words that I have to say that will replicate what Dagmar does, but not nearly as, as fulsomely as she does. I've actually done what I usually do when I do conference papers, and that's that I, I send in a title, and then I try to think about what I'm going to say. And then in the end, I have to change the title, um, as I've done in this case. And my current title, operating title, it's, it's not really too distant from the other one, but I'm, I'm calling it now Notes on the Connection Between Disease and Morality in the History of Indian Mental Health Treatment. Um, so I, what I want to briefly explore here are, the, are these connections between morality and mental health, uh, and specifically mental health care in India. My explorations, as uh, John hinted, and as is my want, uh, will be diachronic, examining some of the modifications of this relationship from the canonical Ayurvedic texts of the early centuries CE to the present. Uh, one way to begin this quick survey is to note that the standards for mental health in India, as elsewhere, are culturally constituted. Any search for absolute universal standards would be a failed enterprise. Uh, for example, one 12th century Sanskrit text, the uh, Ishana Shiva Gurudeva Padati, um, describes as possession by an unusual graha or spirit um, we, what we would today label as genetically engendered spasticity, while possession by another graha results in a condition we would recognize as a form of mental retardation. So both of these are treated as varieties of madness, unmada in Sanskrit, and reflect a mythic imagination that's given rise to a kind of positivism in the uh, form of psychological typologizing that's at least partially grounded in moral judgments that link the individual to the mythic system. Uh, both modern science and medieval tantras would agree that these, expressed as possession or as disability, are chronic conditions originating from birth or conception that have no identifiable, morally recognizable cause. Indeed, only with difficulty uh, can these conditions be confidently diagnosed, even within the Indian system, as possession? Um, the argument against it being that they lack the criterion of appearing um, uh, in the individual suddenly. 
A no agent is identified that's, uh, that has turned a normal person into one afflicted by these grahas or at, by these disabilities. The individuals experiencing these grahas or conditions show no evidence of sudden behavioral changes. Uh, these conditions are then normative, even if they cannot ever be classified as normal. This is what an empirical system or a science does. It defines or predicts normativity, even if such conditions cannot be regarded as normal. In India, uh, mental health and mental illness fall within the parameters of normativity that are, in these cases, culturally constituted and standardized, even if normalcy, a rather different animal from normativity, is more elusive and contested. The conditions I'll discuss here are drawn from the uh, studies of classical Indian texts. I don't address the adaptations or ap applications of Indian, of Asian ideas and practices in Western or specifically American cultural contexts, except in passing and by implication. The only parallel I wish to point out right now um, is that both Indian and um, Euro-American constructions of bodily and psychological practices um, emerge from a common background in a quest for transcendence, are systematized in rather similar ways, in spite of what we shall see are rather different, even opposite goals and visions for these similar practices of transcendence. Of transcendence. But I would rather let these constructions arise from the text rather than from extended speculations on the processes through which this has occurred in each case, because my half an hour will disappear very quickly, too quickly, if I get into all that. So the keys to the evaluation and development of sound mental health in ancient and classical India, which I'm broadly dating from 500 BCE to 1000 CE, may be thought of as, uh, as philosophical and psychological, or rather, more specifically, as culturally, religiously, and spiritually determined on the one hand, and as medically determined on the other. Um, deviation from the norm can be mild or serious, keeping in mind that normativity itself represented by standardized and canonized depictions of sound mental health is constantly shifting and subject to changing cultural, literary, and scientific determinants. In classical India, as expressed in the dominant Ayurvedic medical uh, model, the, the definition of illness is generally given as um, vaishamya, which means literally imbalanced. With this brief definition as a guideline that may be extended beyond both Ayurveda um, and medicine as a whole, um, we must decide what it means to be balanced or imbalanced and how to address it within various Indian cultural frameworks. Um, one cautionary note is that Ayurveda, as described in the Sanskrit literature, is textually dominant, but in all likelihood represented a small segment of the healing modalities and traditions um, within South Asia throughout the last several millennia. Um, we know from the history of Ayurvedic textuality that every successive generation of texts uh, incorporated or Sanskritized elements from local traditions that were not included in the previous iterations of canonical literature. Uh, in other words, the idea that Ayurvedic physicians were unvarying in their practices um, for the last 2,000 years in a quest for an original paradigm or in a quest to replicate an original paradigm of purity that could be forever recaptured is a myth. Uh, perpetuated by the purveyors of the politics of medicine in India only in the last century or so. Um, thus, mental health diagnosis and treatment procedures emerged from, or maybe read from, literary or other evidence of practice beyond the boundaries of Ayurvedic textuality. Uh, among these sources would be the Mahabharata, yogic texts, tantras, and community-based healing systems that lie outside the text, but they can, can be found alive and well in such places as the Balaji Temple in, in Rajasthan, um, which I'll mention in a minute, but, but these may be historicized as a result of extrapolating the present and looking at the past, which I've, which I've done in this big book that John referred to. Among the changes that we can detect um, with a close reading is the role of moral rectitude as a causal factor. I don't have time here to address the deeper question of, the, of what I regard as the anomalous place of, nor of moral choice and personal responsibility in the universe depicted in these texts, but it remains an important question in the long run in addressing any issue bearing on religion and medicine or healing in India. The Charaka Sanhita, the oldest of the major Ayurvedic texts, mentions three kinds of, of therapy or jikitsa. One is called Deva Vyapashraya, which means spiritual or largely ritual traditions, literally that's which is dependent upon Daiva, 
faith, yukti vyapashraya, or rational, including empirical, empirical diagnosis and pharmacopoeia, and satvavajaya, which is um, a problematic term that has been hastily and inaccurately described as psychological, but I can't get into that here. Uh, I've written about all of this, and I cannot repeat what I've, what I've already said. Uh, but on the whole, I see the, uh, that a major divide between treatment in the Ayurvedic literature and practice and what is represented in the uh, Upanishads and the Mahaparata, India's great national ethic, a text on which I've been thoroughly immersed within the last, for the last several years. So, uh, um, uh, I won't describe uh, what I've done in the past, and, but the fact is I'm, I'm, I'm uh, translating the last five Padavans, or major books of the Mahabharata, a project that is of almost epic length it, itself, begun more than 40 years ago, um, and I'm completing that now. God knows when it's going to finish, but it will finish soon. Um, but the Mahabharata is, is basically a textbook on possession and contains voluminous sections on medicine and healing that are often different from what's found in a primary uh, text of Ayurveda, even if it was roughly contemporaneous with these texts. So let's examine a few views of normalcy. So beyond the Ayurvedic definition of disease um, as Vaishamya, um, uh, uh, imbalance, or Roga, the breaking up of strength, and health as its opposite, namely Samya, evenness or balance, or Arogya, freedom from disease, normalcy is heavily construed in moral terms. Um, normalcy is tantamount to normativity, even if the latter term is an analytical term, scientized and drained of its urgency. The Mahabharata, which is fraught with moral dilemmas on nearly all of its 5,000 or so pages, is extremely diverse in its views. Uh, to summarize briefly, from both the epic and the Ayurvedic literature, life in accord with predetermined and canonized rules of dharma is usually a sign of sound mental health. But these rules are not fixed for everyone at all times, and often their canonization is contested. Different codes, expectations, and modes of being in the world are regarded as normal, hence normative, for different people. For example, ordinary householders, mendicants of different orders, women of different social strata and, stra and, strata and standing, deities and their hybridized offspring, uh, philosophers, outcasts, and so on, are subjected to shifting bodies of law. Indeed, social mobility was not actually frozen in India until about the end of the first millennium CE. And even then, up to the present, we see repeated end runs around this obsessive, obsessive attempt at social regularization. Um, the plot of the Mahabharata is pressed forward uh, with a sense of ever-consuming doom, somewhat reflective of life itself, by curses and booms, um, acts of extraordinary will, hubris on a thoroughly unacceptable and almost unimaginable scale, like real life itself. <laughs> Questions of identity, possession, the breaking of vows, promises, and contracts, seduction, adultery, incest, disobedience, defiance of the gods, and the gods' defiance of dharma. In other words, normalcy is given a wide berth. It is depicted <laughs> as the exceeding of limits and the setting and overstepping of boundaries. The, natural, the, the naturally unnatural vagaries of fate, or daiva. Um, what then is normal? Um, was it normal to live and act with the artifice and flawless, flawlessness of Rama in the Ramayana? Was it normal to be the very embodiment of dharma, dharmaraja, and to subsequently gamble away both one's kingdom and one's life, as Yudhishthira did in the Mahabharata? Did this behavior warrant a visit to the psychiatrist's office or a decade of addiction counseling? Was 13 years in exile an acceptable treatment? Uh, was punishment tantamount to treatment in the Indian cultural system? Um, these are questions that we might entertain in passing, but I really cannot address them in this context right now, although we can think about them. Um, so now we should discuss the possibility that medical treatment, including mental health treatment, was as pluralistic uh, 2,000 years ago as it is now. With respect to the present, the anthropologist Sarah Pinto writes of the admittedly uninformative, quote, binary, binary between Western psychiatry and Indian culture. More revealing, she states directly, are, quote, layers of experience, explanation, and practice that make mental health in India an intensely pluralistic scene. The facile dichotomizing of Western psychiatry and Indian psychiatry culture, quote, would be to overlook medicine's own malleability and mobility as well as the long history of psychiatry in India. 
I want to make the point of a pluralist, of pluralistic approaches to, me to mental health care in part because among the higher profile, yet still not very widespread forms of treatment for psychological disorders currently practiced in the US at the moment, army plus and Zen and occasionally transcendental meditation, yoga, and other forms of practice with origins in Asian religious praxis. I should caution the reader or listener to be aware of the potent statements by Donald Lopez Jr. in his recent book, The Scientific Buddha, his short and happy life, uh, 2012, and Bernard Flohr, an article called A Gray Matter, Another Look at Buddhism and Neuros Neuroscience in the winter 2012 issue of the Buddhist Quarterly Tricycle. Flohr gets it exactly right about the transformations wrought upon Buddhism by the academic and scientific um, enterprise of re-engineering Buddhist practice for the modern world. Um, the same can be said of yoga and other more Hindu forms of psychophysical practice, namely that if they're understood in their original and intended philosophical and social context and constructions, they would lead not to greater happiness and fulfillment in this world and better adjustment to societal standards, but to the exact reverse, rejection of the world, abandonment of the binding norms of society, greater uh, dedication uh, to esoteric and transgressive ritual, uh, to the freedom of enlightenment rather than the normativity of socially legislated happiness. Uh, that said, let's look at some of the pluralistic features of early Ayurveda that could lead to the general pluralism exhibited in early Indian approaches uh, to mental health care. So as mentioned a few minutes ago, the approaches to treatment in classical India were empirical, meaning biomedical and pharmacological and ritual, at least as we find it in the medical and allied epic and tantric uh, literature. Occasional references to mantras and what would be broadly regarded as meditation are included within the category daiva, or ritual treatments. The Upanishads, the Mahabharata, and other texts, including the sectarian religious um, histories called Puranas, uh, contain lengthy sections on visualizations and meditations intended to uh, manifest and materialize deities, or indeed to become possessed, possessed by them, or to realize the oneness of the self or Atman and the abstract absolute Brahman, which is, an interp which is interpreted more often, um, uh, much more often than is commonly considered as part, uh, as a part or manifestation of, of a deity, such as Krishna, Shiva, the great goddess, um, or one or another Buddha. These were specifically religious contexts in which re renunciation and abandonment um, were explicitly stated goals. This ideology, however, was directly opposed to the medical regimes presented in the Ayurvedic texts, which were explicitly intended for householders and for normalization, um, articulated as normativity. Um, so, um, the Chadika Sangha, I, I get into a section here on, uh, on, on possession and on different, on different, um, different, de different beings, we can say. Um, and I'll just, I'll just read a couple of them here. I have several pages, which I'm going to not read at all. Um, but, diff but various behavior was characterized as possession. And I'll just read a couple of pa passages from a few pages I've got here. So externally induced madness, agantuka unmada, um, has as its direct cause attacks by gods, seers, celestial museums, fle musicians, flesh-eating demons, semi-divine demons in general, uh, dangerous demons, deceased ancestors. Um, indirectly, it's a result of incorrectly performed uh, internal and external vows and actions from a previous existence. Um, and then I, there's a lot of details about different, about different um, beings, different celestial beings and their, their names and their ranks and their serial numbers. Um, and what causes people to be disturbed by these various things. I'm not even going to go into that. So, uh, because there's just too many of them to list. Some of these texts have like eight of these different beings, some have 11, some have 22 different of these, uh, of these beings um, uh, given. But anyway, what do we find here? In my view, we have an expression of personality types um, couched in the prevailing idiom of the, idiom of the day, possession by ethereal beings of different habits and constructions. Um, in case there was any doubt, Chadika did accept the ontological reality of spirits that were capable of modifying an individual's behavior and indeed sharpen an inexplicable change 
and behavior was one of the symptoms of possession, although this was necessarily uh, backed up by, uh, with evidence of extreme humoral imbalance that could be detected through any one of a number of uh, diagnostic uh, possibilities. How then could this be treated? How was uh, mental illness treated? I think mean, Dagmar gave a little bit of that. Both For both Nidja and Agantuka Umada, which means natural, um, attributable uh, mental illness, such as the, the death of a, of a family member or natural disaster or something that could lead to depression, and something which is Agantuka, which has come upon a person for inexplicable causes. Um, so text uh, recommended herbal and animal products, medica uh, uh, medications, as she described in her paper. Among these would be fumigants, on which they would took, in which they would take foul-smelling ingredients, such as, as um, uh, and very difficult to achieve ingredients, such as tiger's toenails. And I don't know who had the job of going and flipping the tiger's toenails, but somebody must have had that job. And um, a cat excrement and foul-smelling plants, and putting them, wrapping them up in a leaf, and um, uh, and placing them under the individual so that they could breathe this stuff for uh, you know for a while. In fact, they still do this in certain parts of Kerala. I went to one place where they actually administer uh, such things, not exactly according to the old Ayurvedic diagnoses, because they put because they don't mention chili in the in the, in the ancient uh, text because chili came in with the Europeans. But they'll take chili. They don't use cat excrement either, as they have in the Ayurvedic text. But there's other sorts of things that they use. They'll use other smell-smelling smelling, um, uh, excrement and so on. And so. But the doctors say you have to be sure never to do this more than three times a day for more than 20 minutes each time. When you have, and they treat people at this clinic um, with these fumigants or pumas, as they're called. Um, I saw it, uh, or. Uh, different things like that. So this is just examples of, of some of these uh, continuations in the 20th century. Um, but it's only much later in the 20th century that we have, uh, in my view, I mean, I'm not, I, I would hesitate to say that these clinics go back a lot further than this, but uh, certain mental health care uh, centers kind of uh, like end of, you know, like last opportunity healthcare treatment, when everything is un, is, remains undiagnosed properly, um, at possession and healing centers, like is one I've done some, some research at, in a place called Balaji, and a place called Mandipur, which is on the, just off the road between, halfway between Jaipur and, and um, Agra, and another place called Chotanikara in Kerala, not too far from, from, uh, from uh, Cochin, I mean maybe about 40 kilometers from there. So not too far away, where we do have these, these uh, very well-attended uh, clinical treatments where they actually have um, kind of replications of visits to the doctor's office, where, they'll, where some of these um, healers there uh, will write prescriptions out on paper and, and give them to you. And it's, it's kind of like a doctor's office in a way, except that it's not, you're not going to see what goes on there in any doctor's office. Um, uh, these very, very elaborate uh, exorcistic treatments where with loud, it's, it's very shamanistic uh, in, in, you know, with a lot of loud, repetitive music and, and possession and counter-possession and, uh, and occasionally you'll have some blood drawn and uh, uh, sometimes there's a bit of deception going on at one place uh, where they have, that I did attend in Kerala where they have a large uh, vat, in fact, I didn't think of this until just now when I was thinking of you, a large <laughs> vat of red dye in front of the goddess, which when a person is in some kind of a state of possession, reminds them of the sacrifice of, of the goddess and blood, and then the person will go bang their head against a nail that's placed in a tree to draw blood, and then that's supposed to be like scare away the demons, okay? Uh, so there are these treatments that are alive and well in various parts of India. Um, and uh, I was going to quote a long section from a 12th century text, but I don't think I'll do that. But what I wanted to really, because I'm going to wrap this up quickly because we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, but, uh, and I was going to re repeat a little bit of what Dagmar said about defanged cobras and, you know, trained lions and elephants and so on. 
uh, that are used as, as sort of shock therapies for mental health care treatment that, that, are, that are noted and are, that are repeated in texts. Um, I'm, I was actually going to quote a text about a, a 14th century text that was a that I didn't describe in the book at all, but that um, called the Vita Sim Havaloka that uh, uh, provides diagnoses for diseases and treatments based on a combination of um, uh, ritual, astrology, medicine, and um, traditional, you know, traditional treatments combined with all these other things. Which, which I, I, I haven't found this in any other text. And I think it's kind of a one-of-a-kind text, which one of these days I'll get to. Uh, lists like 71 conditions, I think it is, or 51 conditions, diseases, for, and then lays it all out in these, in these ways. Anyway, um, the, uh, uh, so let's fast forward. So we've, we've looked at the, at the classical text. And then I was going to point out a little bit about the medieval text, but let me just read the, the end of it here. Uh, so let's fast forward another six or 700 years to present day um, to the widely varying therapies offered in the last 50 years. We find ritual therapies not too different from what uh, these different strata of Sanskrit texts uh, recommended, um, such as recitations of the names of deities, homas or fire rituals, pujas, uh, general um, offerings to deities and so on. We see humoral remedies in Ayurveda generally to counteract um, wind-based um, uh, madness, well, vata-based ummata, uh, even if the texts say that uh, ummata can also be responsible with uh, the other doshas. This is humoral medicine we're talking about. It can all ultimately be reduced to a vata problem, at least in, in the case of madness. So exorcism, such as we find abology, psychiatry derived from Western models, and increasingly psychopharmacology, including those, the use of Prozac, Paxil, and other medications imported into the Indian medical world, often due to pressure from big multinational drug manufacturers who finance major initiatives to, to convince the rest of the world that it is suffering from psychological problems that only they can define and that only their medicines can cure. Um, so there's actually been considerable research on this. Um, however, various forms of uh, psychological therapies are also entering the marketplace. One example of, of this occurred a few years ago when a plane load of American therapists flew into Sri Lanka on, um, on uh, mercy missions after the 2004 uh, tsunami in order to convince the locals that they were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Of course, the Sri Lankans had no idea what they were referring to, but accepted their free meals anyway. Other therapies are growing, uh, that are growing are, we might say, faith-based and might be seen uh, within the public um, service ethos of the Ramakrishna mission, Buddhist organizations with ties to foreign capital and ideas, and Christian service missions. Um, and these contain various meditation um, programs. Within the India, this is unprecedented because meditation was consistently characterized as too otherworldly, as mentioned earlier. Um, but the modern revisioning and reformulation of meditation as a householder practice, remember I was talking about how it was never a householder practice, um, and there was this strict division between, um, between the practice for renunciates and the practice for householders. And Ayurveda, and this is, this is an important point that I want to make here, is that Ayurveda went totally against what we would see as uh, the kinds of, of contemplative practices that are being um, used today in certain contexts, like the Contemplative Sciences Center. This is, this is absolutely was never done in India before. Um, but it's something that's, that's, that's entering the Indian marketplace, again, the Indian, um, yeah, okay, okay basically <laughs> done. And uh, re-entering re India through Western models, such as what we're so the stuff is what's going on here at the University of Virginia. Um, so, uh, so these are invariably introduced with the usual expectations of better health, greater prosperity, more successful social life, less stress, absolutely against what meditation was about historically. You know, you didn't want more successful social life. You didn't want more prosperity. You know, you were looking for 
to get out of this whole world thing, you know? Um, so modern culture does not operate on the religious paradigm um, of a working class or agriculturally based laity, as was in Buddhism, supporting a religiously committed monastic or renunciate culture. Even if in India the idea of supporting renunciates has always been and remains alive and well. Historically, meditation was intended for mendicants and renunciates, uh, an idea reinforced often in the medical literature. In addition, today's culture are constructed to an increasing degree on notions of randomness rather than providence has diminished the weight of moral error as a factor in disease production. The scientific study of disease has shifted the weight to genetics, the environment, and the dangers within society that produce accidents, for example, rather than on misdeeds in ritual performance or past birth. births. I suppose what my, what my concluding idea would be, or you know, bringing this all together, is that um, there was, uh, historically, the idea of the moral foundation or the moral causation within disease grew and changed. We can see changes in it from the, even from the Vedic period to the period of the early Ayurvedic Samhitas, and then we see it much more pronounced in the, in the Tantric and uh, Dharmashastra literature of, of the early second millennium CE. And now this has been reduced and more scientized um, to forms that we see today. Even in, these, even in these, these last resort healing centers, such as Balaji in Rajasthan, uh, where there may be a couple of hundred healers gathering at any one time, and, ten, and there must be thousands of people that come there every day from all over North India. Even there, um, we don't see moral error as being the, the causative factor. Um, it's much more complex than that, but I will not get into that because my time is over. Okay, thank you.